Welcome back to the Cryptid Iceberg. I just wanted to thank you all for 1,000 subscribers. It really means a lot, especially for a small channel. If you aren't subscribed, like the majority of my viewers, please do so. It really makes a big difference. Thank you all for watching. Gray Aliens Grays are among the most common type of non-human intelligence encountered. Roughly half of alien encounters in the United States and Europe are with gray aliens. They are commonly described as small and childlike, with bald, bulbous foreheads and large black eyes. The head is very large, especially in comparison to the neck, which was compared to a pumpkin on a stick by one abductee. It's common for the abductee to witness two to three greys inside their home who escort the abductee into the UFO. Many alien abduction victims report being medically examined by these beings after being taken aboard their crafts. In general, these smaller grey aliens are commonly reported by abductees to seemingly operate as if they were part of a hive mind, with all of the greys acting and dressing the exact same way, with very little individuality. Abductees often report that the short greys are tasked with taking the abductees to the UFO, removing their clothes, escorting them to the examination room, and performing some non-specialized procedures, such as what appears to be some sort of physical exam. The tall greys, sometimes described as a doctor or a specialist by abductees, then engages in more complex procedures, such as the harvesting of biological material. If we look at some close encounter cases, we see that greys are said to have the ability to paralyze humans, such as in the Valensol case. It's also very commonly said that the greys have a form of telepathy with the ability to directly interface with the minds of humans to relay messages or induce feelings of serenity. One of the most credible encounters with greys and non-human intelligence in general took place at the Ariel International School in Rua, Zimbabwe. On September 16th, 1994, children from the Ariel School were outside playing and enjoying their mid-morning break when something strange began. 62 children would bear witness to the following with staggering consistency. The children saw what most would describe as a silver flying saucer accompanied by other smaller crafts fly overhead and land in a nearby field. Some witnessed the other objects land on the opposite end of the field. When the children got closer, they saw multiple non-human beings outside of the landed craft. Most of the descriptions and later drawings of the beings match the classic gray alien. Though there were multiple beings, some of which were a little different. The witnesses described the beings moving in a very unnatural way. They seemed to hover, float, and glide, sometimes seemingly disappearing and reappearing in different places, or teleporting. At one point, one of the greys disappeared and reappeared in front of two witnesses at a distance of roughly one meter. Again, this took place in broad daylight and at a very close distance. These witnesses are certain of what they saw to this very day. The encounter itself lasted 10 to 15 minutes, although some of the witnesses described a sort of time dilation effect, which is also common with these type of events. Members of the school staff were convinced the encounter took place by the frightened behavior of the children. The day after the encounter, Cynthia Hind, a local UFO researcher and author, interviewed the witnesses and asked them to draw the encounter. The different cultural backgrounds of the children from the Ariel International School caused them to have different interpretations of what they witnessed. Some of the children described the beings as tokoloshes, malevolent dwarf-like spirits from Zulu mythos. Many of the children described being particularly disturbed by the eyes of the beings. This too is common with many other reports. Cynthia Hind was able to contact Dr. John Mack, the head of Harvard Psychiatry Department and specialist in child and adolescent psychology. Mac also wanted to interview the witnesses because of his work with alien abductees. Like many others, John Mack was completely skeptical of the phenomenon before closely examining the evidence. He found his patients to be normal, honest people 
not suffering from mental illnesses, who have experienced encounters, contact, and abduction by non-human intelligence. John Mack risked his career, and even his tenure at Harvard to make this stance, as the university debated on removing John Mack's tenure because of this. As John Mack specialized in child psychology, his assessment of the aerial landing and his interviews with the witnesses are crucial to understanding this case. Like his many abductee patients, he found the witnesses to be of sound mind, honest, yet clearly affected by what they saw. Mack's professional opinion was that the children were recounting a real experience, not something fictitious or imagined. Did you see the eyes? What did they look like? They were um, green like that. Where was the pointy part? Was the pointy part in here or was the pointy part up out there? Up there. And what was the feeling when you looked at the eyes? Um, it was scary. Mm -hmm. And what, scary why? What made it scary? The eyes looked evil. Evil? Mm -hmm. And what was evil about them? Say what you mean by evil. It, the, it looked evil because it was just staring at me. With what? Staring at you as if what? As if to do what? As if it wanted to come and take us. As if it wanted to come and take you. That was the feeling you got? That it wanted you to go with it? Did you feel like you wanted to go with it? No. Did you feel, what was the effect on you when, when you felt it wanted to have you go with it? Well, I just um, walked away and I started crying. At the time of this recording, UFO whistleblower David Grush has recently come forward and testified under oath that the United States government has covered up illegal above top secret programs to retrieve crashed UFOs and biological evidence of quote, non-human intelligence. The testimony of David Grush, as well as other whistleblowers who have yet to go public at this time for fear of retaliation, has clearly influenced and informed Congress to create the UAP Disclosure Act. Even giving legal definitions for non-human intelligence, technology of unknown origin, referencing flying saucers, and even the six observables, or characteristics of true UFOs. Journalists Ross Coulthart and Michael Schellenberger are in touch with the 30-plus whistleblowers who have yet to go public, and there are a number of things which are confirmed independently from each whistleblower. According to Colt Hart, most of the whistleblowers agree that the majority of the non-human biologics recovered fit the description of the classic gray alien. If this is true, then the world will owe a debt to a group of people who have been gaslighted, ridiculed, and mocked for sharing what was in some cases, the most traumatic event of their lives. Wendigo The Wendigo is a cannibalistic monster or evil spirit from Native American folklore. In most of these legends, the Wendigo serves as a metaphor for greed and excessive consumption. The most common legend about the Wendigo states that men transform into Wendigo by committing cannibalism. In some accounts, the Wendigo is said to be a giant creature much larger than humans, which grows with every meal. The Wendigo's lust for human flesh can never be sated, no matter how many humans it consumes. Scholar Basil H. Johnston gave this description of a Wendigo, quote, The Wendigo was gaunt to the point of emaciation. Its desiccated skin pulled tightly over its bones, with its bones pushing out against its skin, its complexion the ash gray of death, and its eyes pushed back deep into their sockets. The wendigo looked like a gaunt skeleton, recently disinterred from the grave. What lips it had were tattered and bloody, unclean and suffering from separation of the flesh. The wendigo gave off a strange and eerie odor of decay and decomposition, of death and corruption. Wendigo psychosis has been documented several times where an individual believes they are possessed by the spirit of the Wendigo and become obsessed with cannibalism, usually after being in a situation with no food. Historically, individuals suffering from Wendigo psychosis were often killed in order to prevent the inevitable cannibalism. In the Jesuit Relations, published in 1661, we are given the following description of Wendigo psychosis. Quote, Those poor men, according to the report given to us, were seized with an ailment unknown to us, but not very unusual among the people we were seeking. 
They are afflicted with neither lunacy, hypochondria, nor frenzy, but have a combination of all these species of disease, which affects their imaginations and causes them a more than canine hunger. This makes them so ravenous for human flesh that they pounce upon women, children, and even upon men like veritable werewolves and devour them voraciously without being able to appease or glut their appetite, ever seeking fresh prey, and the more greedily, the more they eat. Bessie Lake Erie is the shallowest of the five great lakes of North America and is also the most biologically diverse of all the great lakes with the highest amount of fish production. The lake is also said to house the Lake Erie Monster, otherwise known as the Great Snake of Lake Erie, which is often described as a gray serpentine lake monster, often compared to the famous Loch Ness Monster. The oldest legends of a monster in Lake Erie come from the First Nations. Onyere, the Mohawk word for snake, was said to be a water spirit that lives in the Great Lakes. It was described as a horned, draconic snake that breathed poison and fire. It was said to capsize canoes and devour humans, though the creature was said to spare travelers who make a sufficient sacrifice, similar to other native legends of lake monsters. The first recorded sighting, which is attributed to Bessie, took place in 1793 when the captain of a sloop called Felicity was sailing through Lake Erie when a gray serpent at least 16 feet in length began thrashing in the water next to the boat. The captain allegedly feared that his boat would be capsized by the creature, a sentiment shared among many encounters with Bessie. In 1960, Ken Gallick was fishing off a pier in Sandusky when he heard two rats. He decided to throw a couple of rocks at them when he saw the creature, and as he watched it, it pushed itself out of the lake with its four flippers and rested on a nearby beach. In 1969, Jim Schinder stated that a serpent came within six feet of him near the South Bass Island in Lake Erie. He alleged that the creature was two feet wide. The creature was sighted by a woman named Teresa Kovat, who described the creature as reptilian and snake-like with big flippers, much like those of a plesiosaur. She was able to see the creature from the boat she was on and stated, It was so large, it could have easily capsized a boat. It seemed to be playing, unquote. She described the great snake as frolicking in the water. And oddly enough, in the time since the initial encounters, sightings have actually been increasing in frequency. The bloop. The sound you just heard was the bloop, recorded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, in 1977. The sound was loud enough to be recorded on multiple sensors up to 3,000 miles away, and the frequency rose over the span of a minute. So whatever the source was, it was immensely powerful. NOAA's Christopher Fox put forward the theory that the bloop was not caused by man or a geological process but by a creature. For the bloop to be detected on multiple sensors, some at a distance of 3,000 miles away, this creature would be titanic, even in comparison to the largest whales. In 2012, NOAA changed their stance on the bloop, stating that it was most likely an icequake. Here is the sound of an iceberg running aground recorded by NOAA. Though it seems that the bloop really was just an icequake, it's entirely possible that a titanic leviathan of a sea creature is lurking in the unexplored depths of the ocean, yet to be discovered, especially when deep sea gigantism, otherwise known as abyssal gigantism, is taken into account. Though it's not well studied due to the inaccessibility of the deepest parts of the ocean, creatures which dwell in the abyss increase in size with depth, becoming much larger than their shallower water counterparts. Examples of this include the Japanese spider crab, with the specimen on screen being 12 feet long, and our friends the giant squid and the big fin squid which we talked about in part 1. Abyssal gigantism is thought to be caused by decreased predation, food scarcity, if we look at Kleber's law, the larger an animal gets, the more efficient its metabolism becomes. 
and conditions of food scarcity, this can result in gigantism. It's also thought to be caused by colder temperatures, or Bergman's rule, meaning that colder temperatures cause animals to become larger. So it's possible that there could be giants dwelling in the deepest depths of the abyss, some of which we'd probably rather not discover. The Lake Champlain Monster Lake Champlain is a 125 mile long body of fresh water and is said to be the dwelling of a sea monster. There have been over 300 sightings of this creature, which is also compared to the Loch Ness Monster. Legends of sea serpents in Lake Champlain date back to ancient times. The Mohawk called the creature Onyerakoa, a great horned serpent, or spirit, that inhabited the lake and possessed supernatural powers similar to other native legends of sea monsters or spirits. According to an 1819 report in the Plattsburgh Republican titled Cape and Serpent on Lake Champlain. A Captain Crumb encountered a sea serpent nearly 200 feet long with three teeth and eyes the color of peeled onion. Captain Crumb also said that the creature had a belt of red around its neck and what looked like a star on its forehead. In 1883, Sheriff Nathan H. Mooney saw the serpent from the shore. He claimed that it was 25 to 30 feet long and that he was close enough to see white spots inside of its mouth. The sheriff's encounter encouraged more eyewitnesses to come forward. In 1977, Sandra Mansi took this photo, now known as the Mansi photograph of what she believed to be Champ. She sent the photo to Philip Raines, a nautical expert at the State University of New York, to authenticate it. However, she was unable to produce the negative of the photo or find the exact location where the picture was taken, making authentication virtually impossible. Further investigations have found that Mansi likely overestimated the size of the object, which was, in all likelihood, just a log. And the bay area where the photo was likely taken is no deeper than 14 feet, making it impossible for a giant sea monster to be lurking there. In the summer of 2005, fisherman Dick Affolter and his stepson Pete Baudet recorded a video of what is believed to be the Lake Champlain monster. The creature got so close that, at one point, the men feared the creature may even ram their boat. The only publicly available clips of the Baudet film were aired by ABC News in 2005 when the story broke. ABC News even had two former FBI analysts examine the film, who found it to be unmanipulated and authentic. One of the agents did state that at no point in the film is it possible to see any creature above the water. However, according to witnesses and cryptozoologists who have seen the full film, at one point, the creature is close enough for the glint of sunlight to be seen in its eye. So, unfortunately, only a short clip from the film has been released to the public. And it's my understanding that a lawyer is holding the footage, which can be viewed for a fee of $10,000. Cryptozoologists who have seen the footage claim that it is the best evidence of Champ yet. Hopefully in the future, we can get this released to the public. There have been mysterious alligator-like tracks found around Lake Champlain, causing some to believe that Champ could be in the crocodile family, while others believe that the tracks could have been left by a large snapping turtle. Additionally, mysterious sounds have been recorded in Lake Champlain, which are similar to sounds made by beluga whales or dolphins. However, neither animal exists in the lake. Here are the unexplained sounds. The cryptozoologist who recorded the audio believes that they captured the sea serpent using echolocation to find food. It's important to note that no animals known to exist in Lake Champlain use sonar, and no known reptile uses sonar either. It's possible that, like the Loch Ness Monster, which is likely a giant eel, sightings of Champ could in reality be extremely large sturgeon. Perhaps if the Baudet film is ever released to the public, we will get our answer. Amo Mongo often called the Bigfoot of the Philippines. The creature is described as a man-sized bipedal ape with white fur and long nails by both Visayan folklore and modern eyewitness reports. The creature is believed to live at the foot of the volcano Mount Canleon in the Visayan Islands. The name Amomongo translates to ape, monkey, or gorilla, though there are no gorillas that live in the area. On June 9th, 2008, Elias Galvez, 
and Salvador Aguilar of La Castellana suffered multiple attacks from the cryptid. Medical records backed up the eyewitness reports, showing wounds to their faces, backs, and abdomens. The town's police chief, Ted Velez, also stated that numerous other residents have reported being attacked by the creature well into the next day, and that the creature also reportedly disemboweled numerous goats and chickens, consuming their entrails. La Castellana Mayor stated that the creature is not a witch or an asswang, the vampiric shapeshifter that we discussed in level 1 of the iceberg, but a wild animal that was possibly starving. Quote, This is one possibility because there may be no food now in the mountain. Or it might be that Amomongo's habitat has been disturbed by humans. Thus, it runs wild. Unquote. Some believe that the Amomongo could be an albino ape, though there are no albino apes proven to exist even remotely in the area. Regardless, something attacked people and slaughtered animals near Mount Canleon. And the witnesses say it was the Amomongo. Snallygaster. In the 1730s, German immigrants settling in Frederick County, Maryland, would report the first sightings of the Snallygaster, or Schnellergeist, which is German for quick ghost. Later reports would come out of Maryland and Washington, D.C. The earliest depictions of the Snallygaster describe it as part bird and part reptilian, with a metallic beak and razor-sharp fangs. The creature has large wings as well as tentacles, allowing the Snallygaster to easily swoop down and snatch its prey before sucking the blood of its victims. Additional reports state that the creature has a 25-foot wingspan, claws with sharp talons made of hot, glowing metal, and a third eye, which is red, in the middle of its forehead. It's also said that the Snallygaster has a keen sense of smell that aids in helping track down its dinner, and that the creature emanates an unpleasant smell. The creature emitting an unpleasant smell is common in older tales of demons which are said to smell like sulfur, as well as modern cryptid encounters where the creatures are said to smell like sulfur or another unpleasant odor. The Snallygaster seems to be based on older Germanic tales of draconic beasts and blood-sucking monsters that prey upon humans. Septigrams were said to ward off the Schnellergeist, and the same seven-pointed stars can still be seen on barns today. Interestingly, the Snallygaster has a mortal enemy, the Dwyo, a wolfman type creature, and the two are said to attempt to kill each other on sight. In 1909, there was a series of newspaper articles which alleged that many sightings of the Snallygaster were taking place. The Smithsonian offered a cash reward for the creature, and even US President Theodore Roosevelt considered postponing a trip to the African safari in order to hunt the creature himself. One article from February 1909 claimed that a man had been seized by the winged creature, which proceeded to sink its teeth into his jugular and drain his body of blood before dropping him along a hillside. However, the 1909 newspaper articles are now agreed to have been a hoax perpetrated by the Middleton Valley Register in an attempt to increase readership. Devil Monkey The Devil Monkey is an alleged baboon-like cryptid reported across North America, usually in the remote forests of Appalachia and the Pacific Northwest. Devil monkeys have been reported at 3 to 7 feet tall. Aside from its baboon, or sometimes canine-like face, the devil monkey stands out amongst other similar cryptids by its aggressive nature. There are allegedly encounters with this creature reported in newspapers dating back to 1934, though I was unable to find a primary source for this. In the alleged 1934 encounter, the devil monkey was described as having the ability to leap across fields and possessing lightning speed. In 1954, a couple identified only as Boyd were driving through the mountains near Saltville, Virginia, when their car was suddenly attacked by a baboon-like creature. The Boyd's daughter, Pauline, stated, quote, It had light, taffy-colored hair with a white blaze down its neck and underbelly. It stood on two large, well-muscled back legs and had shorter front legs or arms. They went on to describe a second devil monkey encounter that occurred just days later in the same region. Quote, Several days after this incident, two nurses from the Saltville area were driving home from work one morning and were attacked by an unknown creature who ripped the convertible top from their car. Unquote. Prominent Canadian author and Sasquatch researcher John Willison Green 
amassed a collection of 3,000 sightings and tracks of unknown bipedal primates. Among his investigations, John Green investigated a devil monkey sighting, wherein tracks were left behind. These tracks were described as possessing three toes as well as claws. Cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman investigated the slaughter of livestock, which was associated with a devil monkey encounter. In an interview with Animal Planet, Coleman stated, quote, I investigated that case in depth. I interviewed the people who were very sincere. In the whole context of devil monkey reports, it seemed extremely sincere. You have these reports of hairy, monkey-like creatures with tails, very different from Bigfoot." Unquote. Lauren Coleman believes that sightings of, quote, phantom kangaroos, meaning kangaroos reported in areas with zero native population and no reports of escaped kangaroos, whether pets or from zoos, could be misidentified devil monkeys. Deloy's Ape During an expedition to Venezuela in 1920, Swiss oil geologist Louise Francoise Fernand Hector Deloy encountered and killed what is now known as Deloy's Ape. While resting in the jungle near the Tara River, Deloy alleged that two bipedal monkeys, roughly four feet tall, emerged from the vegetation and began screaming and breaking branches. The two apes began to wield the branches like weapons, and, to their horror, the two apes then began to toss their own feces at Deloy and his companions, mortifying them. In response to the feces throwing, they opened fire on the primates, aiming to kill the larger, more aggressive male, but only wounded him before he vanished back into the jungle. They were able to murder the female, and he alleged that the ape lacked a tail and had a unique number of teeth, 32 compared to the 36 of most New World monkeys, which would distinguish it from most known primates. Deloy then propped up the creature and photographed it. Deloy would simply stow away the photo in his notebook and forget about the encounter. However, years later, Deloy's friend, French anthropologist Georges Montandon, discovered the photo of Deloy's ape while looking through his notebook and began to argue that Deloy's ape was actually a missing link between man and ape. Montandon was a proponent of a now debunked theory of human origins suggesting that local human races evolved separately from multiple different primate ancestors, such as gorilla, orangutans, and others. He convinced Deloy to go along with this, and the two faced massive scrutiny from the scientific community. Montandon supported his theory with accounts by the indigenous tribes of a creature they called the Big Devil, which supposedly attacked women. Critics argued that there was no way to verify most of their claims, as the skull of the ape was lost leaving no way to verify the dental evidence, and no photo was taken of the creature's backside to prove its lack of a tail, as well as no way to prove that the ape was bipedal. Among other things, judging by the creature's spider monkey-like face, and some facts regarding the genitalia of spider monkeys I'd much rather forget, it has been soundly determined that Deloy's ape was a spider monkey. Dodo. The dodo bird is a for now, extinct, flightless bird. Native to the island of Mauritius off the coast of Southeast Africa, the dodo is actually an ex-cryptid, as it was widely believed to be a mythical creature until the 19th century, much like the kangaroo and the gorilla. After the arrival of humans, the dodo became prey for the first time, as it had no natural predators on its island paradise. Along with humanity, Many other species were introduced, such as rats, goats, pigs, and deer. The introduction of predators, combined with the fact that dodos were particularly easy to hunt, and the dodo's low birth rates, laying only one egg a year, contributed to the demise of the species by 1690. Very seldomly, people will claim to have a sighting of a surviving dodo bird, but there is no real evidence for the bird's survival. These accounts are likely misidentifications or hoaxes. However, the dodo may soon be resurrected by modern science, as we have both the dodo's DNA and the technology to do so. Colossal laboratories and biosciences are working on the de-extinction of this callously slaughtered flightless bird. The company intends to not only resurrect the dodo, but create a preservation for the dodo on its native home. Fiji Mermaid Another outright hoax. The Fiji Mermaid is a mummified corpse consisting of the head and torso of a monkey stitched to the lower half of a fish, 
which was allegedly caught near the Fiji Islands in the South Pacific Ocean. Allegedly, the Fiji mermaid was sold to an American sea captain by Japanese sailors for $6,000. In 1842, the Fiji mermaid was displayed in the museum of Phineas Taylor Barnum, better known as P.T. Barnum. The creature was described as, quote, an ugly, dried up, black looking diminutive specimen, about three feet long. Its mouth was open, its tail turned over, and its arms thrown up, giving it the appearance of having died in great agony. P.T. Barnum is a known fraud and essentially a snake oil salesman. He coined the phrase, quote, There's a sucker born every minute. Unquote. The original Fiji mermaid disappeared and was likely destroyed in one of the fires that destroyed much of P.T. Barnum's collections. Ghosts One of the oldest concepts in mythology and religion. Ghosts are understood to be the spirits or souls of the dead, often remaining on Earth because of unfinished business from their lives usually because they were murdered or meeting a similarly macabre or cruel death. Many objects, locations, and in some cases even people, are said to be haunted by the spirits of the dead. There have been numerous alleged photographs of ghosts, as well as EVPs or electronic voice phenomenon, where ghosts can allegedly be heard, although there is no solid evidence. One theory that I've always found interesting is the idea that ghost sightings could simply be an imprintation of residual energy left behind by a person, performing the same action over and over throughout their lives. For example, a ghost seen in a rocking chair is not a conscious spirit with agency, but the imprintation of the residual energy left behind by an individual who used that rocking chair over and over in their life. British mathematician Charles Howard Hinton lived from 1853 to 1907. He was very interested in the physics of higher dimensions. A lot of his work focused on attempting to explain the geometry of higher spatial dimensions. In 1888, he actually coined the term tesseract in an attempt to better explain the fourth dimension. One of his first articles was called, Ghosts Explained. Hinton attempted to explain how to imagine and visualize the fourth dimension by arguing that, as from two dimensions to three dimensions, so from three dimensions to four. Many spiritualists, theosophists, and occultists of the time used Hinton's work as an explanation for spirits, psychic phenomenon, and the source of the non-human intelligences mediums claim to make contact with. Many of these groups believed that meditating on the Tesseract and visualizing it could possibly allow glimpses into alternate dimensions, apparitions, and other occult or psychic phenomenon. Hinton also wrote about the benefits of learning to access the fourth dimension with the mind. He believed that this higher dimensional thought could allow our consciousnesses to become more interconnected. Hinton saw the fourth dimension as both physically and psychically real, and believed that it could explain such phenomena as ghosts, ESP, and even synchronicities. Hinton described the soul as, quote, a four-dimensional organism which expresses its higher physical being in the symmetry of the body and gives the aims and motives of human existence." Unquote. Parapsychologists have theorized that poltergeist activity could be caused, at least in some cases, by an explosion of subconscious psychokinesis, extreme emotional states, and often the presence of a teenager seem to coincide with poltergeist activity in many cases. If we look at the CIA's archives, many records from the Society of Psychical Research, among other parapsychological studies and documents on discarnate apparitions and poltergeist activity can be found. Many of these records were connected to a series of military intelligence programs focused on studying and weaponizing psychic phenomenon, which would later be called Project Stargate. The Society for Psychical Research was founded in 1882 with the intent of scientifically analyzing unexplained phenomena without prejudice. In parapsychology, the term apparition is often favored over spirit or ghost, so as not to describe this unexplained phenomenon with ingrained assumptions as to its origin. One of the Society for Psychical Research documents held in the archives of the Central Intelligence Agency describes a haunting or poltergeist case from 1973, which is well known in Brazil. Researchers thoroughly investigated this case, collecting over six hours of audio interviews with multiple witnesses from the family, 
as well as other witnesses. They also took photographs of the damage to the property. The phenomenon began with inexplicable cuts appearing on the furniture and other objects. This happened both in the presence of witnesses and in the absence of anyone. Apparitions of a hairy beast-like or ape-like creature with claws was present throughout every phase of the phenomenon. One of the witnesses, Pedro, stated, quote, I saw the hand and arm of a beast, a monster, not a man. It was very strong and big, very sharp nails. The fur was red, fine, shiny. Much of the unexplained phenomenon seemed to center around a pregnant woman, Noemia, Pedro's wife. Noemia saw the shadowy figure of an entity similar to a gorilla. At one point, Pedro called over two of his neighbors to see the cuts for themselves. The neighbors were very skeptical, but as they questioned Noemia about the cuts, they too saw an apparition of an enormous hand causing one of the witnesses to faint. She later described seeing a large creature with dark fur and long fingers. This phenomenon began to overwhelm the family, who feared their house was haunted, so they moved. This is when Phase 2 began. Orbs or fireballs were seen inexplicably floating throughout the house. Stones were thrown against the roof of their new house. Witnesses were even struck with bricks, seemingly thrown by no one. Stones, sometimes large stones, massive rocks, seemed to move on their own, and even fall straight down from the sky like rain onto the house. As I said, much of the unexplained phenomenon seemed to center around Noemia. The phenomenon progressed from cuts appearing on furniture to witnesses receiving cuts, and Noemia received more cuts than anyone else. Noemia was reportedly cut on her face practically every morning. She was also cut even while outside the house. She described receiving these cuts as feeling like a burning sensation. Now, most of these cuts were superficial and may cause only minor bleeding, but this wasn't always the case. One girl received a deep cut on her leg while visiting, and another child reportedly suffered a deep cut to the thigh. The cut was so deep that the child's grandmother was certain he must have sat on a razor blade, and so they searched, but there was no sharp object. The family would eventually be followed by the phenomenon between three different houses. Altered states of consciousness, similar to a trance, were experienced, and described by researchers as possession phenomenon. It was the opinion of researcher Hernani Andrade, who thoroughly studied the case and the witnesses, that someone performed a ritual to feed from Noemia's energy, and perhaps the energy of her child, to create the poltergeist phenomenon. Some UFO and Fordian researchers believe that there is an overlap between what we would traditionally call the paranormal or supernatural and the UFO phenomenon. Despite the fact that there is very clearly a physical nuts and bolts aspect to the UFO phenomenon, some UFO reports involve paranormal phenomenon such as poltergeist activity following a UFO sighting. These type of encounters, reports of apparitions, are among the most common unexplained phenomena reported throughout all of history. New studies into near-death experiences seem to show that the NDE is not an illusion or a dream, but a, quote, new dimension of reality experienced by the dying person. And here as well, apparitions are a very common occurrence, regardless of whether or not you believe in ghosts yourself. Apparitions are among the most common unexplained phenomena reported across the world and throughout time, and I have no doubt in my mind that these reports will continue long after we've passed on. Giant Anaconda The green anaconda found in South America is the largest known snake in the world. It can weigh up to 550 pounds, and specimens have been verified to be 20 to 30 feet long, possibly even larger. They are nocturnal and spend most of their time in or around water, and can be terrifyingly fast swimmers. The green anaconda is a non-venomous constrictor, meaning it coils around its prey to crush and choke its victim to death. They're even large enough to eat deer. However, the giant anaconda is said to be multiple times larger than the green anaconda. Percy Fawcett, a famous British archaeologist, geographer, and explorer of South America, reported an encounter with the giant anaconda. 
Fawcett claims that the anaconda he witnessed in Bolivia was 62 feet long and possessed, quote, a penetrating fetid odor, probably its breath, unquote. Other explorers reported a similarly unbearable smell, usually caused by the anaconda's breath. Native legends corroborate these encounters with a giant serpent. However, in legend, the serpents are sometimes described as having black scales, horns, or large fiery eyes. In some tales, they are shapeshifters, which can even take on a human form and guard treasure or nature itself. It's entirely possible that a green anaconda even larger than the 30 feet long specimens could have existed at some point, even if it was just a green anaconda with a genetic defect or gigantism. Injured Cold November 2nd, 1966, a sewing machine salesman named Woodrow Derenberger was driving from Ohio back to his home in Mineral Wells, West Virginia, returning from a business trip. Along the way, a car began rapidly approaching Woodrow's car and went around him, evidently in a hurry. Woodrow then saw that 50 feet behind the other man's car was a UFO. Woodrow compared the UFO's shape to a kerosene lamp chimney. The UFO accelerated in front of Woodrow's car and landed, blocking the road. Woodrow stopped his truck. As soon as the UFO stopped, a hatch opened and a man stepped out. The UFO then began to hover above Woodrow's truck, and as other cars passed, they seemed totally oblivious to the UFO hanging over the road, as if they couldn't see it. The man approached Woodrow. He was wearing a black overcoat with glimmering coveralls beneath. He had dark hair combed straight back and kept his arms crossed. Strangest of all, the man wore a wide grin on his face. Other than that, Woodrow stated that, quote, he looked perfectly natural and normal as any human being, unquote. Although Woodrow never heard an audible voice, the man asked Woodrow to roll down his window, which he did. The man spoke into Woodrow's mind and told him that he would like to speak with him, and not to be frightened, but the man then told him that he could speak or think his answer. Woodrow was too stunned to speak, and the man said, quote, Nice to meet you, Mr. Derenberger, unquote, and offered his own name, Injured Cold. He then told Woodrow again not to be afraid and that he wishes him no harm, only happiness. He then asked Woodrow about himself and about the nearby city of Parkersburg. Injured stated, quote, Mr. Derenberger, look at me. I am the same as you are. I sleep and breathe and bleed even as you do, unquote. A truck driver named Walter Vanskoy was heading north on I-77 and was able to confirm the encounter as he saw Woodrow's truck and a man with a knee-length coat standing beside the truck, a second witness corroborating Woodrow's encounter. At the end of their telepathic conversation, Indrid told Woodrow that he would return and to report this encounter to the local authorities. Woodrow's encounter took place 10 days before the first recorded Mothman encounter, which was November 12, 1966. A deluge of high strangeness invaded the area of Point Pleasant, West Virginia from 1966 to 67, with thousands witnessing unexplained phenomena. Author and UFO investigator John Keel traveled to Point Pleasant, West Virginia to research the ongoing events of high strangeness and sustained UFO activity in the area. Among the strange events reported were UFOs, Mothman, Men in Black which threatened witnesses, and also injured cold. During John Keel's visit to the Derenberger home, he too witnessed strange lights, which Woodrow believed were controlled by injured cold. John Keel interviewed many of the thousands of witnesses to the Point Pleasant UFO wave and found many commonalities with Woodrow's encounter among the rest of his body of research. And he told Keel that during one of these encounters, injured told him that his home planet was called Lanulos and that it was in the Ganymede constellation, as seen from Earth. Keel noted that, unbeknownst to most, even among UFO researchers, a group of UFO contactees in Mexico claimed to have been taken to a planet in the Ganymede constellation in 1965, and UFO abductees from South America claimed that they were told by the occupants of flying saucers that they came from the same place in 1968, and again, Indrid Cold wore glimmering, shining coveralls beneath his black coat. 
these same shining coveralls were commonly reported to be worn by various UFO knots, by many different witnesses. And again, I'm not saying that any of this is definitive, and neither does Keel, but it's definitely interesting. As Woodrow's encounters with Indrid Cold continued, he claimed that he was taken to Lanulos, Cold's home planet. Indrid would even tell Woodrow that Lanulos was settled by humans who left Earth in spaceships long, long ago. Despite his encounters being considered outlandish by most, Woodrow's family, friends, and everyone who knew him contended that he was an honest man and that he was not lying. A psychiatrist who was among the first to examine Woodrow would go on to have his own UFO close encounters. I plan to cover Mothman and the entire Point Pleasant UFO wave in greater detail. I might even do a video focused on Indrid. I'll end this entry with a quote from John Keel, written for the foreword of Woodrow's book, Visitors from Lanulos. Quote, no matter how bizarre their tales may be, no matter how emotionally unacceptable their accounts are, it stands to reason that if flying saucers do exist, then there is a chance, an excellent one, that one of these crackpots is really telling us the truth. Woodrow Derenberger may or may not be that one, but he at least deserves a hearing." Unquote. Kappa, a creature hailing from Japanese mythology. The kappa is a type of yokai, or kami, typically depicted as a frog-like humanoid with webbed hands and a shell on its back. Kappa are said to inhabit rivers and bodies of water and become vengeful when they are not revered as deities. They are fond of sumo wrestling and enjoy cucumbers, which are said to pacify them. They are also known to assault humans who do not pay them tribute. Kappa are said to victimize humans by extracting a mythical organ called Shirakodama, which is said to house the soul. Kasai Rex. The Kasai Rex is a living dinosaur which allegedly dwells in the Kasai Valley of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In 1934, an expert Swedish hunter named John Johansson ventured into the Kasai Valley in the Congo, intending to hunt an elephant. Eventually, he noticed two elephants and was about to fire at them, but he realized there was another large creature stalking the elephants from the underbrush. Later compared to a giant lizard or a T-Rex, and described the creature as reddish in color with blackish colored stripes. It had a long snout and numerous teeth. The legs were thick. It reminded me of a lion, built for speed. It jumped out of the underbrush and John fired three times with only one shot hitting the creature, causing it to flee. He then tried to retreat to his camp, crossing back through the swamp, where he encountered the creature again, eating a fallen rhinoceros. He no longer had his weapon with him as he had given it to his servant so he instead took a photo, which seems to be lost. There are other alleged photos of the creature, all of which are proven hoaxes. The following year, 1933, a party of five inspired by Johnson's encounter tried and failed to locate the creature. To me, this creature seems like a complete hoax. Though the Kasyrex is described by most as a theropod similar to the T-Rex, there is no evidence in the fossil record of such creatures in that area. The Lizard Man of Scape or Swamp Most reports of reptilian beings are related to ancient mythology or alien abductions. However, outside of Bishopville, South Carolina, within Scape or Swamp, it's believed that there is a red-eyed reptilian creature which stalks humans. Sometime in the early fall of 1987, George Holloman Jr. was heading home on his bicycle just past midnight. He stopped and took a break to smoke when something caught his eye. What he initially believed was a tree stump revealed itself to be a humanoid who was seven feet tall. A car drove past, with the headlights making the creature's eyes appear to glow red. As the car passed, the creature retreated back into the forest. When Holloman told the police about his encounter, he could describe the creature only as a haunt, meaning ghost or supernatural creature. Holloman only came forward after the most famous sighting, which took place June 29, 1988, 17-year-old Christopher Davis was driving home from work at 2 a.m. when one of his tires went out. He pulled over on a road next to Scape or Swamp to change his tire. Once he was finished, he began walking back to his driver's side door when he saw a giant reptilian creature bounding towards him. Davis got in the car and began to drive, 
The creature tried to grab the car and failed, and then jumped onto the hood of the car. The creature was eventually thrown off the car as Davis swerved back and forth across the road. Quote, I looked back and saw something running across the field towards me. It was about 25 yards away, and I saw red eyes glowing. I ran into the car, and as I locked it, the thing grabbed the door handle. I could see him from the neck down, three big fingers, long black nails, and green, rough skin. It was strong and angry. I looked in my mirror and saw a blur of green running. I could see his toes, and then he jumped on the roof of my car. I thought I heard a grunt, and then I could see his fingers through the front windshield, where they curled around on the roof. I sped up and swerved to shake the creature off." Unquote. Upon making it home, Davis found that the driver's side mirror was twisted off, and deep claw-like scratches were found on the roof and on the door. Unfortunately, there are no photos of the damaged car. Davis was going to keep his encounter to himself, until, two weeks later, the sheriff asked the public for information regarding a strange attack of another vehicle. Strange, monstrous, three-toed footprints were found, pressed into hard soil, and plaster casts were made of the strange footprints, some of which measured 14 inches in length, and can be seen on screen now. The South Carolina Department of Marine Sources stated that the footprints weren't from any known animal, and that there was no chance that this was caused by a damaged or mutated foot either. However, later on, the South Carolina Fish and Wildlife stated the footprints looked phony. Davis told the police every detail of his encounter. He drew this unartistic sketch of the reptilian for police and passed a polygraph test of his reptilian encounter. Although, we all know now that lie detector tests are no longer considered credible. Professional skeptic Ben Radford states that the details of Chris Davis's encounter changed over time, becoming distorted. And he also questions some of the key details of the encounter, such as the visibility in the area at the time. Following Davis's report, there was a rash of lizard man sightings. According to Sheriff Truesdale, these reports were treated as seriously as any other case. State Representative Grady Brown believes that the initial sighting was a hoax. Was there someone dressed up like Lizard Man in 1988? Yes, I believe that. The individual who we thought was Lizard Man has since passed away. Lee County Sheriff Daniel Simons stated, quote, Within the last 10 years, we have received several calls about a possible Lizard Man sighting, and we did an investigation. If people call, we don't turn them away. If someone says they have seen something unusual, we look into it. In 2008, a van belonging to Bob Rawson was seemingly attacked, with claw-like marks and damage practically all over the vehicle. In addition to this, the Rawson's cat went missing the same night, and adjacent farmers found that some of their cattle was murdered in the night, allegedly. The police believed that this was caused by coyotes, the show Monster Quest came to the conclusion that it would require inhuman levels of strength to cause this amount of damage to the car. But there are obviously other explanations for the damage to this vehicle. The Badajoz UFO Incident November 12, 1976 At the Talavera La Real Air Base, located in Badajoz, Spain, Jose Trejo and Juan Luján were in the fuel storage area of the base when they heard an unexplained high-pitched sound. The noise lasted for five minutes and then ended abruptly. They were mystified by the noise, which seemed to have no source. They readied their weapons and began to patrol the area. They were concerned that someone may have breached the base and was attempting to sabotage it. Suddenly, the sound began again and ended after five minutes, just as it did before. However, this time, the men spotted a vertical light in the sky, which disappeared after around 15 seconds. Another soldier, Jose Hidalgo, and his military-trained wolf dog, asked the other two men if they too saw the light. They contacted their guard corporal, who told them to go inspect the site. While walking to the site of the UFO, the men did not feel confident. As the men walked, their wolf dog was undeterred, which gave them some confidence. As they got closer, the men felt a, 
quotes, whirlpool and heard branches breaking from trees. They released the wolf dog and he ran to the source of the noise. The men stood and waited for the dog to bark, but instead he came back stumbling, seemingly dazed. The dog then began to circle the men, which is part of its training, meaning it was trying to protect the soldiers. Trejo suddenly felt a dreadful feeling of being watched. And then, 15 meters away, the men saw a giant luminous humanoid nearly 10 feet tall and seemingly made of light. The creature's arms were held out to its sides, T-posing. Trejo attempted to fire on the entity, but he became paralyzed and fell to the floor. The other two men opened fire on the interloper. They fired 40 to 50 rounds. A bright flash emitted from the entity, and it vanished, replaced by the ear-piercing noise from before. The men helped Trejo up, and soon, the base was placed on high alert. A full search of the area was ordered, though the investigation found no evidence of the humanoid. Not even the spent shells were found in the area. What's really strange is that a few days later, Trejo's vision began to fail, and he fell unconscious. He was hospitalized multiple times at the Madrid Air Force Hospital, with the final conclusion that he suffered a nervous imbalance, which never happened before or after, only during the UFO encounter. The Montauk Monster July 12th, 2008, in Montauk, New York, people walking along the Ditch Plains Beach stumbled upon a bizarre carcass which had washed up along the shore. One of the witnesses, 26-year-old Gianna Hewitt, took a now-famous photograph of the creature. She stated, quote, We were looking for a place to sit when we saw some people looking at something. We didn't know what it was. We joked that maybe it was something from Plum Island. She was referring to the Plum Island Animal Disease Center, a federal government facility which studies foreign animal diseases. During the Cold War, a secret biological weapons program was run out of Plum Island. The program allegedly ended in 1969. Conspiracy theories suggested that the Montauk monster was the result of an experiment, a mutant or a chimera, an animal-human hybrid. Ultimately, it was determined that the Montauk monster was actually a raccoon, partially decomposed by the ocean, causing its strange hairless appearance and its lack of an upper jaw. Mammoth. The mammoth is on this list for the same reasons as the dodo. Though it is extinct, some believe that relict populations survived the extinction, or at least survived longer than our established timeline. Native American and Siberian tribes have legends of a creature which sounds very similar to the woolly mammoth. In 1917, Ethnologists recorded an account from the Casca tribe of northern British Columbia. They claimed that the woolly mammoth went extinct within the past few generations. In 1873, the zoologist published an interview with convicted Russian smuggler Cheriton Batchmachnik, who told of his escape from the mines of Siberia. He fled south and eventually found himself in the Alden Mountains. He made a camp in a hidden valley where he reportedly encountered living woolly mammoths inside of a cave. In the future, the mammoth may truly walk again, as Colossal Bioscience plans to not only resurrect, but to rewild the mammoth, returning it to its natural habitat. The Hopkinsville Goblins On August 21st, 1955, on the Sutton family's property near Hopkinsville, Kentucky, an infamous event in the history of close encounters took place. Friend of the Sutton family, Billy Ray Taylor, was getting water from the family's well when he witnessed a UFO with multicolored lights flying overhead. Witness illustrations depict an egg or tic-tac shaped craft. It stopped and hovered for a moment before descending, seeming to land near the north edge of the Sutton property. Billy Ray ran to warn the others in the Sutton family's house. Billy Ray ran to warn the others in the Sutton family's home. However, out of the 11 people there, none believed him initially. Billy Ray didn't believe that he'd witnessed anything extraterrestrial either. He assumed that it was from the nearby military base. An hour passed and the family dogs began barking violently, so Billy Ray and Lucky Sutton went to investigate. The dog was now hiding under the house with its tail between its legs. They then saw a glowing orb traveling towards them. As it got closer, 
a strange creature revealed itself. The creature had, quote, two large eyes with a yellow glow, more on the sides than in the human face, a long thin mouth, large bat-like ears, thin short legs, and unusually long arms with large hands ending in claws. The creature drew near, with its hands raised open towards the men, as if it was trying to surrender. The men readied their guns, and when the creature was 20 feet away, they fired. Though they were positive they hit the target, the creature just did a backflip and disappeared into the forest. At times, these creatures would seem to hover or float. For the next four hours, these creatures haunted the Sutton home. The men went through four boxes of 22 pistol shells trying to eliminate them. Though everyone was shaken, the children were becoming near hysterical as the beings continued to show themselves. The family waited for their chance and ran to their cars and sought the Hopkinsville police station. The local police went to investigate, accompanied by military police. They found numerous spent shells, bullet holes, and broken windows from the aftermath of the battle. The alleged creatures left behind no tracks or blood, but proponents of this case counter with a witness testimony stating that the creatures seemed to have the ability to float and that the witnesses never managed to spill the blood of the goblins. Police Sergeant Frank Dudas believed the witnesses because he and another city policeman witnessed flying saucers the previous year. He stated, I think the whole story is entirely possible. I know I saw them. If I saw them, the Kelly story could certainly be true. The chief of police who led the search, Sergeant Greenwell, believed the family witnessed something strange because he also saw a UFO during the infamous 1952 UFO wave, which culminated in the UFOs seen over Washington, D.C. All officials involved found that there was no intoxication involved in the incident, and no drugs or alcohol were found inside the house. Despite this, many skeptics insist that this event was an alcohol-induced hallucination. Others argue that the UFO was a misidentified meteor, and that the creatures were misidentified horned owls. The family was clearly shaken and refused to return to the home until the search was complete. At 3.30 that night, the creatures returned, continuing to harass the family. By sunrise, the house was abandoned, 